Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Call it to order. Um, this is the August 17th, 2020, 7 p.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey. With us tonight, we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So, Commissioner Boswell, would you please lead us in the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance? I will. Inspire our heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the everything you do for us. God, we know you're in charge. We know we're not. And thank you for just being with us as a board here. Let us make right decisions for our county. And let us be mindful of everyone in the county. And God, just thank you so much for all your blessings. These things we ask in your name. Amen. 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 You would stand and cast the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, the first item on our uh, for business tonight is a very important and wonderful uh, event. We get to recognize two sheriff's office deputies for receiving the life-saving award. That's Deputy uh, David Eli Gordon and Deputy Johnny Watkins. And uh, before I ask y'all to come forward, I'm going to read the um, citation. <clears throat> I'm going to pull down my mask so that uh, you can hear me better. This letter of recommendation was submitted by B Platoon Leader Lieutenant Larry Kernodal. On Saturday morning, July 18th, 2020, at 2.46 a.m., B Platoon deputies Eli Gordon and John Watkins responded to Rumley Road in reference to a cardiac arrest. Prior to arrival, Alamance County Central Communication advised they were giving CPR instructions to the caller. Deputy Gordon was first to arrive and found the caller actively performing CPR on his cousin. Deputy Gordon was unable to find a pulse on the patient and did not observe the patient breathing. Deputy Gordon immediately began CPR. While performing CPR, Deputy Gordon began to feel the patient's heartbeat and observed the patient begins shallow breathing. Deputy Watkins arrived on scene and began to administer Narcan due to a suspected drug overdose. The patient's breathing began to stabilize. EMS personnel arrived on scene, evaluated the patient, and cleared the patient for transport to the hospital. For their actions, this life-saving award is presented to Deputy e David Eli Gordon and Deputy John E. Watkins for their quick response, decisive action, and instinctively following their training. So that is fantastic. Um, if you gentlemen will come forward and join me and the sheriff uh, with uh, Deputy Gordon tonight, he has his mother, Tina Gordon, and his fiance, Katie Willis. We're proud of you guys. Yes, sir. Amen. Appreciate it every day you got come to work. Sure, Sheriff. Thank you. <laughs> Sheriff, you want to come stand over uh, here? Sure, so we everybody can see all of us. So first is Deputy Gordon. We're going to present this life-saving award to Deputy One David Eli Gordon for your actions on July 18th, 2020 in saving a life. So thank you. All right, and then if you switch places. And then this life-saving award is presented to Deputy Class 3, John E. Watkins, for your actions on July 18, 2020, in saving a life. Thank you for your service. And Tina and Katie, y'all stand up so everybody can see you. That's 
Katie. Um, just in a few short weeks, Katie and Eli are going to be married. And Tina and I used to sit on the bleachers at West Roundhouse High School and watch Eli play football. Um, we sat there with Jennifer Litt and um, Christy uh, Parker. That's right. Christy Parker. So those days. Thank you. Wish I could have them back. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> Thank you very much. This guy will get my money. Okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, public speakers who uh, wish to address the board on topics that are related to the agenda. Um, I would make a special note that one of the items on the agenda is the economic development incentives for UPS. There's a public hearing scheduled for that, so if anybody has any public comments that they would um, feel are appropriate for that agenda item, if they would hold those until that public hearing, that would be uh, more appropriate. Um, part of our public speaker policy is that people with uh, disabilities, if they ask in advance, they can receive an accommodation um, to speak publicly related to their uh, situation. So tonight I understand that we have two public speakers who have asked for accommodations to be heard on non-agenda items at the beginning of the meeting in this public speaker uh, slot. So the first one is um, Mr. Roger Owens. So Mr. Owens, if you want to come forward to the to the lectern, we would be delighted to hear from you. I have a petition here from 700 or 700 750 uh, citizens of Alamance County requesting that you do all you can to. Uh, preserve the monument here in Graham and uh, protect it and preserve it. Uh, uh, do you want to... Do, do you have you? copies? Do you have a copy for each commissioner or do you just no, have one copy? No, well, I've got this, uh, the ones that signed. Okay, you know, if you would just hand those to the county manager, then we will pass them around to the clerk and they will be made part of the official record okay. for the meeting. Okay, Did uh, I didn't know whether you wanted to read them out or what you wanted to... Uh, um, you wanted me to read them out or what you wanted to do? Do you this, have the text of the petition itself? Do you have the petition itself, uh, like what people were signing on to? They, he's got it right there. He's got... Because uh, we don't need to read the names of all no, the people. I mean this, the, the, the petition right. itself. Yes, that petition. would be that would yeah. be appropriate. Uh, okay. Did you want me to read it? Yes, please. Okay. Let's see if I can get some glasses to where I can see it. <laughs> uh, on uh, May 16th, 1914, the Graham Chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy dedicated a monument erected on the Courthouse Square in Graham, North Carolina. On the north side of the monument is inscribed to commemorate with grateful love and patriotism, valor, and devotion to duty the brave soldiers of Alamance County. On the east side of the monument is inscribed faithful unto death they are crowned with immortal glory. Please tell us within the inscriptions where there lies a hint of slavery, hate, or racism. There is no hate or racism to be found. The only rest within the misinformed who want to destroy the Confederate monument. History cannot be changed, and even though a small portion of our community thinks it can, heritage will never change. Allow the monument to remain where it has peacefully stood for over 100 years without incident in the name of love and honor. And this monument probably means a little more to me than a lot of people in the county. My great-grandfather, John Romanus Euless, was in the Civil War. He joined the Confederate Army on April the 8th, 1862, at the age of 18. He just turned 18, I think. He was in there until the end of the war in 1865 and was at Appomattox when, with Lee when he surrendered. The monument represents the average soldier like my great-grandfather. 
It is not glorifying some general or high-ranking officer. My great-grandfather did not own a slave, nor did any of his relatives. In fact, in my studies, I can't find where any Euless ever owned a slave. I hope you will honor the request of these 700 uh, people signatured. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Thank you. Okay, the second person that we had sign up or requested an accommodation um, to go at the beginning of the meeting was Jonathan Nelms. Is he uh, in the overflow room? Can somebody check for him? Have we got Roger's address so we can get those back to him after, after we make copies? If we can get your address, sir, we'll make copies and give them back to you. Roger Oakland, 8110. <clears throat> What's his next name? Jonathan Nelms. Nelms. Nelms with an N. Two seven three N E L M S. <coughs> and while Mr. Nelms comes forward, I made an error. I should have asked Mr. Owens to uh, repeat his name and his address. Um, for the record, Mr. Owens lives at eighty one ten Cable Mill Road. So welcome, Mr. Nelms. Um, uh, yes, my name is Jonathan Nelms. I actually was not aware I signed up for a special uh, early portion, so I was ready to wait the entire time. Um, but you want to? I mean, you don't have to go now. It's, that was my understanding from you signed up the last yeah i just didn't i wasn't aware support. there was an open slot for that so but here i am uh and thank you everybody well, i don't want me to feel uncomfortable or singled out or like weird. not at all not at all i'm i'm i am not here to speak about a monument or a virus or a mask <laughs> or anything like that i swear <laughs> um i own a local company called carolina management group here in graham we've been in business since 2008 and my commute in here was longer than my commute to work this morning because like everybody else Who's actually at work right now? <laughs> um, but a lot of what my company does is staffing. Normally we work with people, all, uh, you know, various businesses all across North and South Carolina. Lately I've been working with folks all across the country. And uh, it's hard because I have a condition that is at best life-threatening and at worst terminal. Now if my health holds out, I'll be running for mayor of Graham in the next ele mayoral election. We'll see what happens. Um, but a lot of who I've been working with are seeing Alamance County in, in a particular light. And this isn't coming from a portion that's a color or an economic or whatever background. It's, uh, I have one contact as far away as Sydney, Australia, who can now find Alamance County on a map because we are world famous. Maybe we're world famous for the wrong reason. I don't know. But uh, I put forth the candidate who survived a three hour interview with a company in Seattle, Washington last week. Three hours. At the end of the meeting, I got a call from her HR coordinator in that meeting who said, can you find me somebody else exactly like that person but not from Alamance County? Because nobody from your area is really a cultural fit for us right now. You're in the middle of a new civil war in Alamance County, another person told me. The individual who didn't get that job lost out on $120,000 a year that was a remote working job that could have been coming into our community. I won't see $120,000 in my lifetime. I've been working every day since I was 14. I don't know many people that would throw that kind of income away. But it's worth noting, I think, a study came across my desk this morning and said one in five people 20% of Alamance County are, uh, are disenfranchised. So that's 20% of people we maybe could boost up and add to our community's bottom line and really get a lot more going. Um, and I saw another study that said under 5% of children born right now will ever see the outcome of, of getting out of poverty. I think we're all getting a little older. That number's probably gonna increase. But, uh, you know, my company is very dedicated to helping people provide jobs. 
and it's really hard to provide jobs when people are turning down qualified applicants. I have somebody with a current PhD who is excited that he's going to be interviewed to be a manager at Burger King. PhD. Anyway, I hope you all are dying to have new jobs in the area because I know literally I am. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Thank you. And could you tell us your address, please? I neglected to ask you that. I'm at 3299 Patriot Place in Graham, Thank but you. I also have properties where I'll be staying in Graham, Graham City limits as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. Those are the two uh, citizens, residents that we had signed up for public speaking at the beginning of the meeting. Do we have any commissioner responses at this time? If not, um, the next item is to approve the agenda. I would ask, I would make a motion that we amend the agenda as presented to add a closed session for, uh, for one, to preserve attorney client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. And then also a closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3 um, to consult with the county attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege in a different matter, which can I say the nature of that matter? It's a personal matter. It's a personal matter. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to amend the agenda. Is there any discussion or other amendments? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So next would be to approve the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Lashley and Mr. Carter. Um, we have a, mo a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next item is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve the consent agenda, and this um, Mr. Lashley has made a second. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Uh, the next item is to our public hearing on the economic development incentives for United Parcel Service. Before we uh, ask for a vote to open the public hearing, we have Kevin Zalatel and Tom Healy here from United Parcel Service, and also Mac Williams, who works for the Chamber of Commerce and is also our Economic Development Coordinator for Alamance County. And I think that you all have a relatively short informational presentation. Is that right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. I'm Mac Williams with the Alamance Chamber. Delighted to be here tonight uh, that the project of UPS has gotten this far, and hopefully we can keep it going. Uh, Kevin is the Senior Project Manager uh, with responsibility to, to the engineering and the building and the construction, so he can answer those kinds of questions. Tom is here in a different capacity, but also available to help answer other questions around the project, and so we're delighted to have both of them here. From their respective places within the company and uh, on the screen you will see uh, the area in the north carolina commerce park that is the site uh if i can step over there and outline yeah give us a reference there back yourself uh, out <laughs> don't really. so from here all the way over to here is the site area this is a creek uh this is the walmart property here uh, and so it's all this it's all this land all the way to uh, all, I'm sorry to here it doesn't include this it includes this to this and, and all the things in between the road and the highway uh, well, what's so the total acreage? Uh, it's, it's 165 acres 165 acres thanks Mac but uh, I'm Kevin Zolotel I am a senior project manager for UPS working in the engineering function and um, I'd like to review with you a proposed project that would be in the Mebane, in that area I identified there. Max showed you on the site plan. And uh, that site would allow us an opportunity to build an initial building 
that would be able to process 30,000 packages per hour of larger packages and an additional 15,000 packages smaller as a initial uh, building for that site. But the property also allows us the ability to have two future expansions, one that would take the capacity up to 45,000 packages per hour, and then one, the MAC site is capable of providing a facility that could build, uh, process 58,000 packages per hour, plus the smalls. So it's, it's a uh, very challenging site, but I think it's a site that will work to meet our needs. Uh, we've done a preliminary site plan, and um, we're working on finalizing that, and should be able to have something to present in about mid-September uh, for that property. So um, the site development plan um, would allow us to construct a building that's 521,000 square feet. It would have remote facilities to support that, uh, automotive shop, it would have a vehicle wash bay, it would have an employee entrance building, and we're also looking at having a remote customer center where uh, customers could come and either pick up their packages if they weren't home, or to drop off and ship packages. So be capable of those opportunities. Um, so that, that's pretty much um, the building itself. Now the job opportunities, uh, there'd be 451 new full-time job equivalents uh, provided for this facility. Uh, our schedule looks like if we were able to finalize it and get started on design later this year, we could possibly open the first phase of that building in 2023 with half the capacity, about 15,000 per hour, and then build out the rest of the uh, system and, and open up that to the full 30K in 2024. So that's the time frame that we'd be looking at uh, for this opportunity. And a lot of it is uh, once you get your shell building up, there's the package handling system, uh, be a fully automated system um, that would be in there and that takes some time to build out and commission it. Um, there will be a driver, um, package drivers out of this location. They're the ones that drive in the brown vehicles and also the tractor trailer drivers. And then we'd have um, uh, package handlers within the building, unloading and loading of the uh, trucks and also helping processing, bagging the smaller packages. So um, that's pretty much the, uh, the site. Um, UPS is a uh, technology company that delivers packages, so we would be relying on technology and technology in this area uh, to help provide um, timely delivery and meet our customers' needs. And again, the site does look like it can meet our future growth opportunities uh, as UPS grows, the community grow with us. So that's all I got, unless anybody has any questions on it. Uh, on the topography there, you got the creek on the low side. Mm -hmm. Just, wh what are you looking to do on that? Okay, um, the, the side closest to the interstate is where the core building would go. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the site closer to Senator Ralph Scott Parkway, we would have three entrances. We'd have an employee entrance that would be almost directly across from the Walmart distribution entrance. So they would loop up to the employee okay. parking lot and that would be on the left side of your page. We have two entrances for the UPS Brown package cars, we call them, the tractor trailers. And one would be on the far right, and one would be closer to a central portion of that site. And they would have to bridge over the stream wetland area. So we'd have to do three, maybe four bridges to get across. The fourth bridge is for maximum uh, site development. So I'm not sure if we'd have to build that now or in the future. Right. That's all stuff that work work out as we get through the design. But uh, I would build a support structure to support the 45K. And then if we build that finger, we would take that down and then replace the trailer staging uh, closer to Senator Ralph Scott Parkway. And we would build towards zero trailer staging. But the main core building would be up along the highway. Zion. Okay. That's all I said. And it would, um, you know, we've got to design it, but we've been building uh, precast, tilt up concrete buildings, uh, some of the automotive shots might be a metal, prefab metal building. Is this one, a project y'all have done before similar to this same construction? Um, we do them throughout the U.S. So, similar. So, so we have building. done a 58K facility before 
and this one would start off at 30k okay. about half the capacity it was capable of and again a lot of it's driven by our growth and the needs in the area very good okay now, was that 451 ftes or 451 full-time employees full-time jobs full-time yeah and your average was i think around 64 thousand a year yeah i think it's 62 something 62. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um what would be your base or your entry level salaries for the um, how many would you have at an entry level the part-time average part-time salary is around thirty-two thousand for a part-time employee and after a year they get their benefits so it also includes benefits i'm sorry steve it's sixty-five thousand. 147. Okay. That's All right. what you got in your proposal. In the, so. in the, okay. <laughs> We're going to hold you to it. <laughs> All right. How many did you say you would have at that? Four. The part timers? Um, I'd say, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably going to be around 1,000 part time jobs. 1,000? 1,000, thousand, yeah. There's going to be um, four sorts a day. And some of those jobs will have people that will work full time covering those sorts inside. So you've got part time inside, full time inside, full time drivers full-time journeyman mechanics, full-time automotive mechanics, and full-time tractor trailer drivers. So and then you have your management team, the support team, management. You've got full-time specialists, full-time supervisors, managers, division managers. They'll be managing that operation. So a total of about 1,500 employees then? Probably right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh. Wow. And, um, there, we get part-time uh, employees that come to work for us for the benefits, and then some of them want to go to school. So it's a good job for students. And then you have other other people that want two jobs, two part-time jobs. So if you have two part-time jobs, then it's a full-time equivalent. And they work part for, part for us and part for another company. And then you have the dedicated full-time employees. That needs to get a little bit more publicity. That sounds really good. Student jobs and young people jobs. Yeah, yeah. The, the form that we fill out to start this process is a state form that only asks for the full-time full -time. jobs. It, it doesn't right. count on the state form any temporary part-time or permanent part-time. So what he's talking about is a thousand permanent part-time, which are which are also benefited jobs. Right. So would that be like 20 hours a week, or um, it varies 20, 25 hours. 20, 25 Could, hours a week. Yeah, it depends on the workload. But they get a, a guaranteed hours. Right. You know, so many hours per week. Okay. And a lot of those are students. We try to employ a lot of students, college students around the area. Right. Yeah, and and their actual shift is based on the work, how much buy you know, package we got to process. Right. And generally, normally our busy time is from Thanksgiving to Christmas, but right now we're seeing busy times year round. Oh, yeah. So. It's been uh, pretty busy, so they've been working a lot. Everybody's shows. buying online, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's probably okay. by my house yeah. occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. So, so this packet, uh, this project was driven before any of that came up. And so we got a report back. Uh, I think I think it was in the second quarter. We got a report that there was a 21 percent decline in retail sales, but a 21 percent increase in online sales. So. Yeah. And you guys have to deliver all that, right? Yeah. I know. I know our volume has been been picking up. It's a UPS get rich quick scheme, right? <laughs> it's all uh, <laughs> We're we're going to be here through it, the good times and the bad times. Yeah. So we've, been, we've been around since uh, 1907, wow. so we've been here a long time. Great. All right. Does anybody else have? Is anything? he going to speak, or I have some questions, but I'm going to hear no, everybody. Please, no, please. Okay. Oh, uh, our any of these jobs coming in from other areas in other words are you shutting down any other areas to bring them here i'm not aware of any uh, mr sutton on that form the state asked that question on that form that uh -huh. we submit to get this whole process started and on that form the answer is no these are brand new jobs yeah, they're not test. taking them from any place else they're not okay. shutting down any place else it's all, right. all brand new, 451 new employees at UPS. All right. I understand Greensboro was talking to you about some expansion scenario. Yeah, that, they have needs there, too, and they're yep. building additional small, the smaller packages, smaller right. capacity. So they have capacity needs, too. So, so you have a facility in Greensboro yes. and right. boy, Raleigh? Uh, yeah. Raleigh, yeah. Charlotte. Yeah. Charlotte. Yeah, Greensboro's this, been over there forever. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. This one here will be able to handle any any type of package. 
It'll be fully automated. It'll, it'll be a, uh, the large bulk packages were challenging. We'll have a system for processing those. And this one here can relieve the capacity of any other location that doesn't have the capacity. But you're not shutting down any other entities to come here? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, because I know there's some, uh, there's been some publicity in Kentucky uh, about some un union issues and so forth and so on. Now, would this be a unionized Teamster plant? Yes, yes. It will? Now, is that automatic or do they vote on that? As far as I know, it's automatic. <laughs> Change of operation and yeah. then they, what I don't know is whether they're machinists or Teamsters for the mechanics. It depends on the state what they are. Okay. So, but the, the all the drivers and part-timers will be Teamsters. Let me go ahead and say, uh, I think you've probably already heard about me. I vote no <laughs> on incentives. I, I have for a decade, uh, about a decade and a half. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, I don't blink on that, but uh, I think UPS is a great company. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a UPS employee that didn't work his fanny off, and uh, I've always enjoyed the brown truck. So, <laughs> welcome to Alabama County. Yeah. Okay. Well... If there's no other questions, we will um, ask you all to return to your seat. Okay. And we will ask, I'll ask for a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lashley, for the motion to open the public hearing, and Mr. Boswell for the second. All in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so we're now in the public hearing for the economic development incentives. Um, is there anybody on this side of the room who would wish to be heard on the economic consensus package for United Parcel Service? And um, Fire Marshal Payne, if you could hold on just a second before you go in there. Um, I'm going to ask on this side, is there anybody on this side who wants to be heard about the economic consensus package for UPS? All right, before you go in there, uh, I understand we have some people in our overflow room, and I just want to uh, clarify that during the, um, this public hearing on the economic incentives package, that the comments um, should be limited to those that pertain to the project itself, such as the terms of the contract or the incentives generally, and whether they're good investment and um, comments should directly address the proposed economic incentive and not uh, deal with extraneous issues. Um, and the case on point for that is Steinberg versus Chesterfield County Planning Commission, which was the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit case from 2008. So, Mr. Payne, if you would uh, ask in the overflow room if there is anybody who wants to be heard on the... Um, economic incentives for UPS. <coughs> Hello. Hello. If you could uh, please give us your name and your address. My name is Meg Williams and I don't feel safe giving my address publicly because I've been threatened by neo-confederates in our streets who are emboldened by that monument and your continued silence. So I'm actually not here as an individual citizen anyway. I'm here as a representative of six different organizations based in Alamance County. Alamance Alliance for Justice, Down Home NC's Alamance hey, chapter. Williams, could you hold on just a second? Um, are we running the clock? Because oh, I believe there's a um, five, five minute. minutes. Time yep. limit for, thank you, public hearings. So again, I'm here on behalf of Alamance Alliance for Justice, Down Home NC's Alamance Chapter, Forward Motion Alamance, Siembra NC, Alamance Whites Against White Supremacy, and Alamance Agents for Change, who are all actually here to address our UPS representatives. Okay, Ms. Williams, your um, comments need to be directed toward the board. Uh, they have exact, the, uh, they actually sorry, have to I'm do so with speaking. their ends. I'm speaking I'm first, so speaking. actually. You don't I get don't to cop so. over me. It's my Ms. five Williams, minutes. 
This it's is my five public, minutes, and I'm going to speak to the UF, UPS representatives about their incentive package because we're asking you to include in your incentive package. Ms. Williams, I'm asking you to remove. Ms. Williams, I'm asking you to return to your seat, please. As a, as You're a being disorderly. Is this is a disorderly conduct in the course of a public meeting. Why do we need to listen to her? If, she, if you're not going to listen to your constituents, not being courteous why, in your language and presentation. My language is plenty courteous. We are here to address UPS no. because as a company who is committed to, address to UPS, racial UPS, equity to and to the, to the, board. the principles you're not outlined in the, the UPS the Foundation, <laughs> we urge I'm asking you to take the social to conditions of Chair, our community. Chair, if you would please take what steps because right now. Williams, no, nope. I'm not leaving because meeting. I get five That's minutes right. to speak and I have four and a half minutes left you to speak. Your right. No, I did you not either. Your right. you, you get your hands off of yeah, me. You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> Best to thing to do is move on out the door, lady. Let's go this way. We ask you to be civil. I was perfectly civil. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, I was. I was reading it perfectly civil. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, during uh, a public meeting, the or public hearing, public comments, any of those opportunities to be heard in this limited public forum, comments will be addressed to the Board of Commissioners and not to individual members of the audience for any reason. Um, looking for my statute, which I think I left on my desk at home. Right there, thanks. Clyde, you got it. Disruption of the public meeting of statutes 143.318.17. Thank you, Mr. Albright. And um, <coughs> let the record reflect, thank you. Let the record reflect that um, I did ask Ms. Williams to return to her seat and she refused. Um, is there anybody else in the overflow room who wishes to be heard on the public and the economic development incentives? for United Parcel Service. <laughs> Thank you. There being no more uh, persons to be heard on the Economic Development Incentives for United Parcel Service, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Second. 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 Mr. Lashley has made a motion to close the public hearing and um, Ms. Vice Chair Carter has seconded it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the public hearing is closed and now we move on to uh, entertaining uh, a possible motion on approving the economic incentive agreement. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter to approve the economic incentive agreement. Um, does anyone have any comments before I, we uh, I, I call do, for a vote? I think, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming to Alamance County. We appreciate the opportunity for people that need jobs in our county. I know we're in a hard time, but you guys are the essential business right now, and we appreciate that. Thank you for coming to Alamance County, and I'm ready to vote. I'll second that. I'll we're hurry. glad you're here. I've had friends that's been at UPS for 30 years and love it, part-time yep. and full-time. Um, I'm thrilled about this project. I think this is going to do so much to grow the economy and the um, vibrancy of our community for years to come. This is going to grow our tax base. This also has um, benefits to the families who will be supported, paying mortgages, um, their own property taxes, uh, dance uh, recitals, uh, supporting our public school system, um, doctor's offices, all the different amenities in a community will be fostered and nurtured by the pres having UPS here. It's just a great company. Um, my husband, used to uh, be in the Air Force, United States Air Force pilot. He works for a different company. I <laughs> uh, won't say that. Well, um, but he has many, many friends who work for UPS. It's, uh, the aviation community is a big family and, um, and it is a wonderful company and we're so pleased to have the opportunity to partner with you in um, 
helping you with your business interests and helping us with growing our community. So with that being said, if there's nothing else to say, nope. um, all in favor of Mr. Lashley's motion, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No. All right, thank you. Motion carries with um, Mr. Sutton dissenting. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a request to set a public hearing for the Alamance <coughs> County Draft Solar Energy System Ordinance. Our Planning Director, Tanya Cattle, is here. Tanya, welcome. Well, thanks. We're glad you're here. Also. <laughs> All right. I'm going to take this off while I speak to y'all. Thank you. <laughs> that way I can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Carter been asking what? I don't know. <laughs> this, tonight, we're kind of down the road a little bit from what you all voted <laughs> on earlier this year in February. We right. went through and we updated the HIDO, and solar energy was in that HIDO. Uh, that was, I believe it was a class one there. So at that same meeting, we introduced the idea of planning board would like to take on the project of writing the specific ordinance for solar energy farms, per se, not solar energy and residential use. So here we are. They went into a small group and did a subcommittee of just three members of the planning board, drafted up something with our legal department as well. It's gone through planning board, so now we've brought it to you all. You all have that draft in your packet. I do, however, have a short... PowerPoint just to pull out the differences in what was approved in the HIDO and what's being proposed in this ordinance. So here's your timeline that we're talking about. February you all move forward with the project in July planning board approved and today we're going to request a public hearing for September 8th should that be the board's wishes. Definition wise you'll see the definitions are a little bit different from the HIDO to the solar energy. So the HIDO um, speaks and says uh, any standalone plant not ancillary to another land use which is intended for the commercial generation of electric power from solar hydroelectric and wind so part of the hydro we're just going to end up pulling that solar piece out the rest of that definition will stay and those types of uses will keep their use in hydro and the restrictions in the hydro for the solar energy system there's a lot of words here but it is solar farms that are not on a residential piece. If you put solar on your roof or in your lawn, that doesn't apply here. This is simply for the large, I mean, 10 acres is your minimum acreage for this. So large farms is what we're looking at for this one. The next thing is very inclusive. So for setbacks in the current HIDO, it's a 150 foot setback. In the proposed solar ordinance, we're talking about a 75 foot setback. And setback meaning, from the actual array of the solar panel to a property line. Uh, land use spacing in the HIDO for this category, there was no land use spacing, and we're continuing that in this solar ordinance. Lot size is the same, both say 10 acres. Uh, access road, specific in the HIDO, there was language about an access road could not be within that setback. The planning board has suggested that the access road could be in the setback moving forward because uh, literally it goes around and there's some fire apparatus piece to that but it goes around the whole solar farm for checking purposes and once constructed they're generally used about once a month unless of course there's a fire need. Uh, in the current HIDO a decommissioning plan meaning once a solar farm is done being used and some of them are 15 to 25 years is what they write these contracts for there is no requirement for a decommissioning plan in the current HIDO so if something were to happen and a plan a farm stopped being used, it just sits there. We don't have any way to enforce getting that material off that land. So with the new uh, solar ordinance, there is a full decommissioning plan expectations and then there's a sample in right. the back. So that gives us a little more teeth to that ordinance. Uh, landscape buffer, slightly different. Current HIDO calls for a 50 foot wide buffer and then that needs plantings eight to 10 feet apart. In the proposed solar ordin energy ordinance, a 30 foot wide buffer is being proposed. That actually came from some expertise sitting on our planning board, new member, but knows a lot about landscaping. And I think in our original HIDO and everything, we didn't have an expert that could explain what a 30 or 50 foot difference would be. So even if you have to do triple rows of planting, you don't need 50 foot to do that. So the 30 foot came about because of just how we wanted it laid out and you really practically didn't need all that. So we're looking at a 30 foot uh, buffer there. Like I said, land use spacing protective facilities. 
Um, in the current high dose, since there was no land use spacing, there's no protective facilities. So in the uh, solar energy system, uh, all of the recognized by our Historic Properties Commission pieces, whether it be the land or structure, will be considered and need a 100 foot setback from a structure to an actual solar panel is what the measurement would be to. So that's the only protective facility we're looking at for solar, opposed to no facilities for the high dose. Uh, stream protection, we did a lot of work on that for the high dose, so that was left exactly the same. How we wrote it originally will be the same here. Um, aviation, something that was not included in the mm -hmm. high dose, is included here. We have very little in the county, but just in case, this is kind of a protective thing. We could get anything out by the airport or we could get a new type of airport. So this is more informational if, that we would have to get from people if you're within that five mile radius. It's not saying you can't put it there. It's just a list of things that you're going to provide to right. us should you need to do that. Uh, public notice, both have public notice pieces and where the original Hydro did not, that is included in this now. Approval process is a little bit different than the HIDA. HIDA says it's going to planning board and then it's going to commissioners. For the solar energy, it says we'd like to make the planning board the final decision making board and you all will be the appeal board for that. And once it gets past you all, that's a court proceeding. Uh, variance language, if somebody needs some forgiveness on a piece, there is language in both ordinances for that. That's a very quick overview, but y'all do have the draft. Plenty of time to think about because we're asking for a public hearing uh, at the next morning meeting. Well, you did have the uh, language in there too to notify surrounding yes. property owners. Yeah. Um, would we be informed of, the pro of a, an application when it came up? So we'll have to rearrange our computer system a little bit, but it can do the same thing that we have with the hydro applications. It will be able to do the same thing. We'll just so, have to so get our IT friends to help us. When they yes. Apply. Yeah, real sensitive to finding out about stuff after the fact. So. I totally understand that sense, didn't it? Mm -hmm. But that was a quick breakdown. I didn't want to go through and read everything, but just showing some of the biggest differences in the two. So ones. this will work through a lot of the issues we had with a couple of the previous people applying. Right, and we still have some in the wings. They're waiting to see what we're going to do with this to see if they're kind of which order they want to go in or the current one or the new one. I like, I like your new idea. Mm -hmm. I do too. I think it's very positive. I think the 30 foot buffer is yeah, going to be a I big, like that. Yeah, we're still getting the same plus. landscaping we had before. Right. We're just keeping it in a shallower yeah. Yeah. buffer. You start using and all the, your land up the buffer, you, you lose what Right, and the big for. thing was nuisance. Nuisance usually for solar farmers more visual <clears> than <throat> anything else. So the planting's got a lot more interest and a lot of dedicated I'd time. I'd rather be looking at trees and some of those panels. I think it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll move that we approve for the 8th of uh, September. September. It's Tuesday, September the 8th at 9 a.m. would be the public hearing. I just want to uh, add that, you know, I'm the board uh, representative mm -hmm. to the planning board, represent the county commissioners there. So I've had the opportunity to observe and, and listen to the discussion, and they've done such a great job. The subcommittee really worked hard on this for a long time. The industry has had a, a ample opportunity to comment. I think we all remember when we were working on the HIDO mm -hmm. that those solar farm mm -hmm. um, companies had concerns that we, I think, weren't really equipped to address through the HIDO. And I think that those um, concerns have mostly been addressed. Yes, I expect there's probably going to be a couple more hanging out there that even after subcommittee and planning board looked at, they were really felt like we need to keep the ordinance the way it is. And I expect they'll probably show for our public meeting. Yeah. Have their concerns. I'll second Bill's motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second to set the public hearing for the solar energy system ordinance for Tuesday, September 8th at 9 a.m. Is there any more discussion? <coughs> If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone you. opposed? All right, thank you. Next, we have our uh, inaugural presentation by Alex Rimmer, the interim health director, <laughs> about COVID-19. Good Welcome, evening. Alex. Hey, good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me tonight. So I'm going to start with today's case count. Um, we had 2,701 cumulative cases, 2,440 are out of isolation.
We have 219 active cases, and of those 219, we have 13 in the hospital um, and 42 deaths as of today. So I just wanted to start with some good news that um, we've been able to provide to the community. Um, through emergency management funds, we've been able to provide 2,520 hot meals to our community since May 1st, 752 meals from Alamance Burlington School System, and this is to children 18 and under that we're able to provide lunches to. Um, there's been 172 groceries delivered, um, and it's allowed people in quarantine to stay home. So um, that's thanks to emergency management, United Way, and uh, the uh, county employee food drive. So um, a lot of different people come in together to be able to provide that. And then there's been countless deliveries of masks, thermometers, supplies, um, letters to people for their employment, things like that. So we've been able to get that out. A big thanks to Burlington Parks and Rec and Alamance County Parks and Rec for providing staff on top of our health department employees. So we'll take a look um, up here. So this is our seven day running average. And so what that shows you is the blue bar graph is how many cases um, per day. And the green line, it gives you the three day average before and after. And so you can see that first peak in there that's going to be right after Memorial Day. That's around the time um, a lot of the restrictions were lifted. And so um, then it kind of declines afterwards as the need for testing went down a little bit. And then it came back up right after July 4th. And we've been holding relatively steady. Um, in the past seven days, our average case per day is 30. The week before was 33. So that is a positive note um, to take a look at. This is our cumulative case count. So this just gives you an idea of um, what our nurses and um, case investigators are working on. So this shows you on the left side, 219 active cases and the um, 2,440 that have been released and the 42 deaths and your totals over there on the left. Um, when you look on the right, that's actually showing your close contacts. So that's the people that are under monitoring. So our staff, um, are following up currently with 688 close contacts and so they're checking in with them daily to see if they have signs and symptoms, getting them to proper testing, um, and making sure that they are staying quarantined for the right amount of time. So that just shows a lot of great work going there um, to protect our community. This is our weekly testing in Alamance County. So as you can see, our percent positivity has gone down a little bit, and we're hanging out about 7.5, 7.6%, um, which is down. You know, we were around 9 for quite a while, went up to 11. That would be your July 4th peak again. Um, and you can see the testing has held pretty steady. We had a pretty good week closing on August 1st. Um, there's a little bit of lag when getting test results, and so that's just showing some numbers. Um, I suspect in the next few weeks that'll go up and I'll talk a little bit why in just a second. Can I ask a question about the test before yes, we go forward? Um, is the test that is being administered now, I believe that uh, the health department is working with some other agencies and doing some testing around the churches and stuff in the county in the next few weeks. Is that the same test that I've heard about where they shove the thing up your nose? The cotton swab? Yeah, so there's a there's a few different types of tests. There's the one that, you know, we refer to as it's almost at your brain, basically. There's the nasal swab. Um, there's the antigen test now, which is the nasal swab. There's several doctor's offices in the area that are starting to get those. So what that allows for is if you test positive with the antigen test and you have symptoms, it has a pretty high rate of accuracy. And you know immediately versus the other tests where the turnaround time is anywhere from 24 to 72 hours, depending on where you go for your testing. So, um, yeah, but yes, to answer your question, it is the okay. that test. Ha have you started any of the saliva testing that they're talking about? So the health department hasn't. So right now the state lab still is doing PCR mm -hmm. testing. And so that is, as the health department, that's what we're doing because we're able to send those tests there. So this is our cumulative case breakdown for race and ethnicity. Um, we recently did testing at St. Matthew's AME Church this past Saturday. Um, so we were able to get one of our historically black and African American churches. Um, we had a really great turnout. I don't have an exact number for you and I don't want to misquote, but um, 
there was a really great turnout. So if you look here, you can see in Alamance County that black and African American cases are about 13.9. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we're making tests available to that community. Uh, and we did receive a task order award. So um, I know in the beginning we had a pretty high rate of percent positivity. And so we were picked to be one of the op nine counties through the state. And um, they gave us a vendor, which is Piedmont Health Services, one of our local vendors. And they're offering testing to historically black and African American populations. And so um, like Commissioner Gailey was talking about, it's the faith in action, the COVID drive through testing. Um, the advertisement has started on that and so you, you may have seen it so they're reaching several areas they're going to be out on Altima Hall Union Ridge Road they have three different churches coming together um, Ebenezer United Church of Christ on Apple Street which is near um, St. Matthew's where we were at the other day and then Elon First Baptist Church so they are offering those all throughout the community and they have worked with us to try to find areas to go in order to do that and the health department um, on Thursday will be at Blessed Sacrament to try to reach the Graham area um, because we haven't been able to do that in the past. And so we were just trying to reach Graham and be a little bit south of the highway in order to get kind of some of the Southern Alamance residents. This is our cumulative case breakdown by age. Um, if you see, Alamance County has a little bit higher than the state and zero to 17. Um, you may have seen a press release recently. We had a daycare with a cluster. Um, I think this is something that's gonna, we're gonna see more of. Um, just children being in daycare, there's virtual learning academies or little schools popping up. And so that's something we're working really hard to try to get education out there to try to minimize the spread. So um, that's just something kind of on the forefront for us. So 25 to 49, um, that's your pretty standard the majority of the working population so that's why that number is so high they're out and about and if you look at um, greater than 65 so we're actually a little bit lower than the state's numbers and I attribute that to our long-term care facility task force um, I know Stacy has previously talked about it and I think they just have done a really really great job in educating um, our long-term care facilities and really um, staying in contact with them And this right here, um, this is our cumulative case by zip code. And so, as expected um, with population, the two Burlington zip codes are gonna be the highest. So, the um, Piedmont Health Services, that three church partnering that they're doing, and Ebenezer, those are in 27217. Um, so, Piedmont Health Services will be reaching them. The uh, Graham zip code will be reaching them through Blessed Sacrament. And then Elon will be reached, um, the 27244. So we haven't been able to be in that community, I don't think, since the very beginning. And so we're going back to see um, testing there. And that, that is a historically black and African-American church. So um, using that from our task order award. Do y'all have any questions? Yeah, I've got one, if, if you don't mind. Oh. I think you're showing and have been showing like 2,500 or so confirmed cases and 2,200 of them or so have been pretty much let go. That's a quick in and out in my opinion. Has been. <clears throat> so that leaves about 200 and some that are being still watched. And if you divide the population into that figure, you get like 1.2 thousand of, of people who have it based on population and and all I'm saying is how does that compare in your opinion with the rest of the state and or nation uh, and or world I mean, I know maybe we're testing differently than they are and so but that just seems like a low I mean I hate anybody gets it and for gosh sakes I would hate that anybody dies from it but 1.2 thousandths <laughs> is is to me odds that people have to look at it. I mean, we have to know the stats on this, but how do you feel about that stat versus other counties, our state, and nation, and we'll just leave it at continental United States, whatever. 
So as far as Alamance County and looking at North Carolina as a state, so North Carolina has been around 7% um, for the past few weeks. And we're getting really close to that number. Um, is that mass confirmed, right? That, so that's percent positivity. So what that's right. doing is it's taking the tests that are done and that's the number that are positive. So that's, that's what that's looking at. So really the goal from the CDC is to be below 5%. And so we still are a little bit high um, but I think it's really important that we reach those areas that we haven't been able to reach yet. And so that may skew a little bit of our percent positivity in the next few weeks because we are reaching these people that haven't had the ability to be tested yet, some of our marginalized pop populations. And so I think the biggest takeaway from this is getting to everybody in our community and um, having the testing available for them. I think that, um, you know, when we talk about COVID, there's a lot of unknowns with it and um, keeping people under monitoring that have been in close contact, I think that that probably does reduce a lot of the cases. And so um, as a county, we've had pretty, pretty good luck with talking to these folks and doing education and having them stay, you know, isolated. So, so that 7% and the five that we're at now, I think you said, right? So we're at 7.5. Okay, seven. Mm -hmm. But that's confirmed cases, right? That's percent positivity. Okay, yeah. not the ones that have, I mean, that's the total of everybody that's mm -hmm. been confirmed, let go, and Right, so, so the, the, there's been 2,440 that have been released from isolation. Yeah. Now, how long were they in isolation? So, it depends a little bit. Um, for somebody that's symptomatic and tests positive, um, the new recommendation from the CDC is 10 days since symptom onset, but they also have to have 24 hours fever-free and improvement of symptoms so the cough's not going to be gone necessarily the fatigue's not going to be gone but the it needs to improve um, there is a little bit of difference with immunocompromised individuals or if they're severely um, have severe critical illness and that would be somewhere around 20 days um, so it ranges there are some people that it takes longer um, to reduce the to have the fever free 24 hours but if they do have that and they do have improved system, uh, symptoms, it's 10 days. So in the testing, are, are a lot of the people coming to get tested, are they, are they having symptoms or just they come because it's next to their house now? So I don't have the answer to that um, because we don't, ask, that's not one of the questions that we have filled out. Um, so I can find out, but we don't, since we're not asking that question, there's really I, no data. I understand that, but I mean, you see, where they're coming from, right. you know, if they're coming from their church and, mm -hmm. you know, are, are the people having symptoms? Is that why they're coming to get tested or are they just coming because they're having a test? The I can ask that question. Send them. The doctor send them. Yeah, a lot, of a lot of times well, the doctor will send not, them. If you're having one at the Ebenezer Church, right. the doctor ain't sending them over yeah, there. Yeah, but I'm talking about the ones that go get tested. The doctors say you can you got to get tested before I'll do the operation. Yeah, but what my question is, are these people sick when they come to get tested? I think there's probably a mix. So we know that there's people that are asymptomatic that will test positive. Um, Ms. Romer, could you hold on just a second, yeah. please? Same. Sheriff, is that person outside using an amplification device? You want to show that? I mean, if y'all came here, we will go tell them to leave. Yeah, we're trying to follow by the governor's guidelines, and it's hard to hear our uh, health so, director. <laughs> as I understand it, the protesters are allowed to chant to at least a certain degree, but they, they are not allowed to use amplified speech. And it would appear to me that... She can't be that loud. At least one she person is, is using amplified speech else. out there. I also um, think that when many people chant together, that that is in itself amplified speech as well. Um, let me ask uh, the other commissioners if they are finding that the noise is disrupting the meeting or they are having difficulty in uh, concentrating on the presentation or, or focusing what, what did you say? and being distracted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mr. Sutton, are you finding that the noise is disrupting? How much longer have we got to go? Let me ask that. 
Um, well, we got Ms. Rimmer to finish up, and then we can have a, um, a recess after she's done. I think I'll do a recess. I'll be honest with you. You know how I feel about the, yeah. the, the debate. I don't think I've made any bones about it, but I'm okay <laughs> for now. Okay. You know, so. I, I don't have any more questions. Yeah. Thank you for okay. answering the ones I have. Thank it's you. really not disrupting me at all. I've got my <laughs> hearing okay. aids turned up. I can hear fine. So. Okay. I can hear them, and I can it's hear the people me. in here. So. It is bothering you. You finding it to be disruptive? Yeah. Um, we'll, take well, we'll take a recess and then maybe assess the situation downstairs and discern whether or not they're using some kind of amplification device because the, the reason to use an amplification device would be to disrupt the meeting right because they can hear each other fine it would be so that we can hear them and then we would be disrupted and impacted by that so yeah. let's take a 10 minute recess mm. everything good all right so let's uh Come out of recess and we will resume the meeting now at 8.16. Um, the next item on the agenda is uh, from the tax department. Jeremy Aikens, our tax administrator, has something about aerial photography. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me here again. I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, some aerial photography. We've gone over this a few times in the past, talking about the, uh, the different approach that we are now taking with revaluations. So when I started with the county, my job was to go around and look at houses, and we would walk up to the front door, knock on the front, make our way around the house, trying to get a thorough understanding of what was out there in the place. And in my goodness first couple of years I, I did quite a bit of that and I had all the traditional war stories the dogs that chased <laughs> me you know uh, the the people pulling knives on me guns on me all sorts of interesting information um, and back then I never thought twice about it now in the work that I do today when I send somebody out there I can't stop thinking about it you know, when is it going to be that something's going to go the wrong way? Um, beside which, there's efficiencies that are, are present um, with using aerial photography instead of walk around. And there's conveniences to the citizens. So with aerial photography, instead of walking up, knocking on the door, walk around the house, you get a high resolution aerial photo. The plane flies over and it takes a picture at four different angles and knits those together so that in the office we can pull up a picture of the home or the business and rotate it around. We can see all four sides. We can take measurements from it if we need to. Uh, it really replaces that need to be out there on foot for most properties. Now some properties there's a problem with visibility. We still have to go out. So it does not completely replace it, but it dramatically reduces the need to be in the field. Now we're more efficient. Now we're safer. And now it's less inconvenience to the homeowner because we're not in their backyard. Uh, so this is, this is a plus. With the model that we've uh, been moving forward with, with the additional staff and with budgeting, we've already prepared to uh, purchase the aerial photography. The, the monies are already budgeted, but we've been trying to select a company to provide that. And I would like to go with uh, Eagle View. They purchased the old pictometry company. And I don't know if you're, you're familiar with the, the Xerox phenomena where people call a copy a Xerox, even though it's just a copy, Xerox is a brand. A lot of people call oblique photography pictometry. Uh, in my profession, if you say, did you get the pictometry on that, you just mean, did you get the oblique photography? But their company is so synonymous with oblique photography. Uh, they have an economy of scale. You know, I, I compared to the other uh, companies out there that provide this service, and it's not even close when you talk about the price of the service and the quality you can get for that price, simply because you've got a much larger fleet of aircraft. Uh, they can distribute those costs. And so I think this is the, the best company to go with to provide this service. Now, the contract terms, um, to get the best rates, uh, there's a three project, I don't want to say commitment because you can cancel it between projects, but they want to fly one project every three years. So over a total of nine years, they would have three flights and we get three different sets of imagery. 
over that nine year period, the total cost of the agreement would be $385,875, which breaks down to $42,875 a year, which is a, a very good price. That's less than we had planned on spending. So I'm very happy about that. Now, we do have the, op the option. We could do one project, which is a three year commitment. If we don't like it, we stop funding it. We just cut it off and say, we're not doing this. Um, and we do have the ability to, to get out. However, I've talked to a lot of counties. I've never seen anybody start it and not like it. There's so many uses, because not just for tax. There's uses for planning department. There's uses for inspection, emergency services, law enforcement. Because the whole county would get the benefit of this high resolution kind of 3D style imagery. And, and there are just a lot of applications for that. So I don't anticipate wanting to cut that off. Uh, but certainly we have that flexibility. Because of the amount of the agreement, that's something that has to come before this board for approval, and I'm seeking that approval this evening. Are, are there any questions? I, I think, Jeremy, this may be a company a lot of roofers use. Okay. I, for some reason, that name's kind of ringing a bell where they can actually zoom in on the roof. They can tell you how many linear feet of ridge oh, cap yes. you need. Oh, uh, yes. Which is very amazing to me mm -hmm. to be able to do that from satellite imaging mm -hmm. and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea to me. How mm -hmm. much did we have budgeted for this originally? Oh goodness. Um, I believe we, we did it on an annual basis. Was it, well I hate to speculate, I know the original budget was 60000 a year and this would be forty two eight. I'm trying to remember if I reduced that down to 45 because I got in preliminary numbers. Uh, regardless, it was less than the 60 I intended on, less than the 45 that I might have put it down to. It's okay. mixed in with other items in a single line item. So the line item is much higher than that, but the amount of that line item I was intending okay. for this use is more than that amount. I will make a motion then. I'll if second. Any more questions? <coughs> Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Carter to um, approve that agreement with Eagle View Technologies. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, Susan Evans, our finance officer, is going to present an uh, installment loan and a resolution. Good evening, Commissioners. If you don't mind me, I'm going to slide this mask down to talk. Um, before you this evening is a resolution to approve an installment loan with J.P. Morgan in the amount of $923,990.07. And what this will allow is for the county to purchase a 2021 um, Spartan Gladiator chassis with a 24-foot non-walk-in heavy rescue body and equipment for the Alamance County Rescue Squad. Um, as you will recall, during fiscal year 2021 budget, commissioners approved for $100,000 to be set aside as a debt service payment. So this gave us a rare opportunity in how we issued our RFP this time. And it was basically, we told banks, this is how much we have in debt service. What will you be able to lend us? Um, JP Morgan came back with the lowest interest rate at 1.53%, um, which will allow us to maximize that $100,000 over 10 years to be able to have an installment loan of $923,990, which roughly we would pay $76,993 in interest. So that truly does maximize for our rescue unit. That's good interest rate. <laughs> Very good interest rate, I'm pleased to say. Um, Kyle Buckner, Travis Loy, and William Monty are here with Alamance County Rescue Squad. So if you have any questions concerning the equipment or the truck, they're here to answer those questions. And if there are any questions concerning the financing, I'll be glad to answer those now. I want you guys to know we appreciate what you, what you do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the time you spend. We thank you guys for yeah. the work you've done with us. You, you really don't understand um, how much it means to us, our members, the county, and anyone traveling through the county because the rescue squad here is very, very important to the safety and the well-being of the citizens of this county and the citizens and the folks that travel through that county. So we want to thank you for listening to our needs and understanding our needs. 
Thank you. I believe we'll keep did. the older model truck too for a backup. Absolutely, that truck will be uh, stationed at a different location for better response uh, further out in the southern part of the county. Right. Thank I'd you. like to make a motion to approve. Second. Vice Chair Carter has made a motion to approve and a second by Commissioner Lashley. Is there any more discussion? And I know Mr. Carter has done a lot of work with Rescue and, and helping them with uh, coming to this point. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Definitely. They're good people. Good, good yeah. people and a very interesting stuff to look at, too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have uh, budget amendments. We have some fiscal year 19, uh, 2019 2020 year end designations. Uh, Mr. Haygood, are you going to handle oh, it? I can. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm requesting this evening that uh, the board approve to designate $366,566 from uh, fiscal year 1920 for, uh, to cover a few expenses that we see coming in fiscal year 2021. We're asking Mr. Haygood, that. Haygood, I'm going to interrupt you. Yes. I'm sorry. Does anybody else hear a bell? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm checking or a tin can or something. I'm checking them. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. So, uh, of this uh, $366,000, uh, $193,922 we would ask to be designated to be used by our emergency management uh, department for EOC events. This year in our budget, we went very lean. We have no contingency, we didn't have any funding. We usually budget funds every year for the uh, emergency management to use in the event of civil unrest, uh, ice storms, hurricanes, there's nothing this year. So these funds are from a FEMA reimbursement uh, from a hurricane, I think in 2018. We just, we, we received those revenues in um, last fiscal year. We'd like to designate those and they would be put at Debbie's disposal to help emergency services in the event we have uh, large events and we need to tap funds. Uh, then uh, also $100,000 we're requesting to be designated. This is debt service for the uh, crash truck that we just approved. So we budgeted $100,000 last year to pay debt service. We're asking to be able to carry it over. Uh, since we didn't purchase the truck right. last year, we'll use this $100,000 uh, to make the payment this year. And we're also requesting that the commissioners designate $72,644. This was from maintenance, county maintenance's budget from last year. If you recall this year in our budget we did not budget any CIP money we, we did not budget any of the 250,000 buddies group had this $72,000 left over in a couple of equipment purchases and some projects that we'd like to carry with us uh, into this fiscal year and uh, be able to be used on some uh, other maintenance projects so uh, the total amount we're asking for is $366,566 and we also have some funding for the landfill um, I don't know, Susan, if you might be able to speak to that a little more than I am. That, that's a project, I believe, that was uh, scheduled to be done last fiscal year, that the funding was budgeted, but will be completed this year, and we're asking to bring it over. That's correct. It's $132,488 is for their paving project. There was some infrastructure that Richard had to take care of at the landfill before he could then bid out the paving uh, contracts. So with this approval, he'll be able to put out the contract for a bid and then proceed with that project in this fiscal year. So, so they're paving around the convenience area there. That's right. They have done, uh, they've done some road repair and some road paving work, and uh, this work would be done around the, the main traffic area. It's nothing to do with the other part that eventually we will do something with. Right? That's correct. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Car Vice Chair Carter has made a motion to approve the budget amendment and has been seconded by Commissioner Boswell. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Uh, now we have a budget amendment from the Health Department. <laughs> All right, so um, 
we have two different agreement addendums to talk about tonight. So it's very similar to the money that Stacy presented in April. Um, so one of this is COVID-19 CARES activities money. Um, that's $60,231. The other one is enhancing detection activities. Um, and that one is $266,436. This money is a little bit different. Um, it was um, given to us through the EPI branch, unlike the last um, amount that we received, that was from preparedness and response, but it all has very similar goals. And so just a few things that we um, have projected to use it for um, is reaching out to the community to historically marginalized populations um, hiring and um, the projected nurses that we need for our staff in order to do proper case investigation ongoing as well as having enough staff in our clinic um, and that that number is around two hundred and six thousand um, dollars we have spent close to forty thousand dollars of the original money in April and that was on nursing staff to be able to do case investigations um, we're looking at getting a data platform and part-time data manager in order to um, better serve the community and show our data and um, use that to reach the populations that we need to um, bilingual hopefully a bilingual staff person that can be in our case interpretation um, to help us uh, the interpreter line is very costly and so having someone in that room that could do interpreting would save a lot of money um, so the overall goal of both um, of the these funds um, is to increase testing, increase contact tracing, um, work on a community risk assessment, which we'd be able to do through that data platform and the data manager, and infection control. Motion to approve. <coughs> Second. All right, we have a motion to approve the budget amendment by Vice Chair Carter and a second by Commissioner Lashley. Is there any discussion? I mean, um, <laughs> Got my eyes crossed. I'm sorry. Another side. Mr. Boswell. <laughs> so, um, uh, is there any discussion about it? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Sheriff, did I hear somebody beating on something out there? Yeah, let me You know. <laughs> We'll back I'm really fine and well we're about to go into the public speakers and we have a few mr. Payne how many uh, people did you say there are in the overflow room there was eight earlier, I'll check. if you would check um, we might we have room in here we might be able just to bring them all in here so they don't have to sit in the overflow room and go back and forth we can accommodate people since there's space there's just uh, eight of them thank you Alex Sound like pipes warming up in an old house. <laughs> the radiators. <laughs> so we do have all these public speakers to get through, and then possible commissioner responses, and we have a county manager's report. So thank you, folks, for coming in. Um, since uh, as the, I'll wait until everybody gets in. As the meeting progresses, we have staff who are in the meeting room who are here to do presentations or guests who are here to do presentations. And then as the meeting progresses, they you know, finish their business and leave, and so we create room in here. So I thought that uh, we would uh, you know, take y'all from the overflow room since there's space in here now. There's no reason for you not to be in here. So you're welcome. We're glad you're here. If anybody feels like you're too close to another person or you don't feel like you're safe from the virus in here, then, you know, you're welcome, just, to, go you're welcome <laughs> to go back. It's just a suggestion that since the space is opened up in here that it might make things flow a little bit more smoothly with having you all in here. So um, if, uh, so if you don't want to be in here, then you don't have to. And we will accommodate that because we don't want anybody to feel unsafe from the virus um, and we want to respect your preferences 100%.
So the next item on our agenda is public speakers who want to speak on items unrelated to items on the agenda. Before we, uh, I call the first person up to the lectern to address the board, I want to review the public comment policy. It's been my practice since I've been chair to do this periodically um, to help the public to be aware that we do have a public comment policy and that there are um, expectations and um, and requirements for participating. So the public comment period is held at the beginning and the end of each regular commissioner's meeting. Speaker comments during the first public comment period are limited to items set forth on the meeting agenda. Speaker comments during the second public comment period may be limited to items set forth on the meeting agenda, but it's not tonight. Speaker comments during the second public comment period may be on any topic of public interest. Each public comment period is limited to a maximum of 30 minutes. Because subjects of special and emergency meetings are often regulated by law, um, blah, 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 that doesn't really apply for what's uh, the issue at hand. Down, the commissioners have a commissioner's response period immediately following the public comment period for follow-up or addressing issues that arise from the public comment section. That's the point of response from commissioners to respond to comments that have been made, not debates with the public. Each person desiring to speak during the public comment period has three minutes to make his or her remarks. There shall be no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. As uh, long as I have been chair, and I don't know, how, you know, I don't have personal recollection of how it was done before I became chair, um, but I've interpreted that to be three speakers in favor of a topic and three speakers in opposition to a topic um, so that we have more opportunity for me, more people to be heard. It's recommended that speakers desiring to speak on the same topic and advocating the same position choose one person to speak for all. Speakers shall be acknowledged by the board chairperson or other presiding commissioner and shall be allowed to speak only in the order designated. Speakers shall address the board from the lectern at the front of the room and begin their marks by stating their name and address. Um, speakers who require accommodation for disabling conditions should contact the county offices um, not less than 24 hours prior to the meeting. Public comment is not intended to require the Board of Commissioners to answer any impromptu questions. Speakers shall address all comments to the commissioners as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Discussions between speakers and members of the audience shall not be allowed. Speakers shall be courteous in their language and presentation. Failure to abide by this requirement may result in forfeiture of the speaker's right to speak. Uh, speakers who have prepared written comment, written re remarks or supporting documents are encouraged to leave a copy of such remarks and documents with the county clerk. Speakers shall not discuss any of the following matters which concern the candidacy of any person seeking public office, including the candidacy of the person addressing the county, matters which are the subject to public hearings, and matters which are closed session matters, including but not limited to matters within the attorney-client privilege, anticipated or pending litigation, personnel, property acquisition, and matters which are made confidential by law. Speakers shall not use profanity, speakers shall not use racial slurs, and speakers shall not engage in personal attacks that by irrelevance, duration, or tone may threaten or perceive to threaten the orderly and fair progress of the discussion. And this uh, policy was uh, adopted as revised in January of 2019. So all that being said, it is 8.39. And I will call the first speaker to the lectern who is uh, Ron Osborne. My name is Ron Osborne. I live at 2585 Neilwood Avenue in Graham. I have lived in North Carolina all my life and in Alamance County for over 35 years. My family first settled in North Carolina in the 1660s. Part of my property has been continuously owned by my family since the 1750s. My direct ancestor was a neighbor and acquaintance of Regulator Herman Husband and their names appear on deeds together Another ancestor made muskets use at Guilford Courthouse. 
My grandfather's grandfather fought for the Confederacy, was captured at the Battle of Chancellorsville, wounded at Spotsylvania. My grandmother's great-grandfather fought at the battles of New Bern and Kinston. My wife's grandmother's great-uncle was killed at the Battle of the Crater in Petersburg. And we had ancestors involved in other battles, including at Gettysburg. I share these scraps of family background to convey to you that I have a deep appreciation and awareness of history. My sons and I are Civil War reenactors, and I'm familiar with the inscription on the Court Square Monument, which appears to pay homage to those like my ancestors who served in the Confederacy. I must tell you that the simple presence of this statue in the Courthouse Square, a place which should promote and guarantee justice for all, which should be a place which represents all citizens equally, is as much a divisive symbol of the injustices inflicted on many of our citizens as it is a reminder of any gallantry and sacrifices of mine, perhaps your ancestors. History tells us that those who dedicated this monument in 1914 were the very citizens who lynched Officer Wyatt Outlaw in the same square. They enshrined this statue not just as a memorial, but as a veiled threat set in stone to all people of color to know and keep their places as second-class citizens in our county. You, our elected leaders, have been confronted with a choice. Do you accept as your legacy the defense of a symbol of our checkered history where both you and our county are known for refusing to acknowledge our known shortcomings of the past? Or do you embrace this opportunity to seek our community's redemption, to improve our reputation, improve our economy, and demonstrate that we are a county welcoming and fair to all? Move the statue away from our house that aspires to justice here. Demonstrate that blue lives as well as black lives matter by memorializing the travesty of our community visited upon Officer White Outlaw and other citizens of color. And be known through posterity as the leaders who embraced an opportunity for positive change. For if you don't, I anticipate that future leaders surely will, robbing you of this momentous honor that could be yours. Thank you for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, we also have um, rules of procedure for the Board of Commissioners, which include, which are also available to be viewed online on the Commissioner's website, which includes the, um, that, I can't lick my fingers because of my mask. thing the decorum of the audience is article 6 section 7 um, audience members shall refrain from making unsolicited comments during the meeting during speakers from the floor or debate by the board audience members shall refrain from conduct which disrupts the proceeding this conduct may include but is not limited to cheers hissing booing clapping cursing or any other conduct which disturbs the proceedings so I would ask you to please refrain from um, applause. Also, it takes time and um, reduces the amount of time that we have for public speakers. The next person on the list to speak is Davida Reed. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Go ahead when you're ready. Please um, give us your address too. Um, I was informed um, possibly not to give my address. But I am a member. Do you live in what? Where do you live? In Graham, Burlington? In Graham, yes. Okay. That's okay. good. <laughs> and I'm a Quaker, but I cannot speak for the whole Quaker meeting. I'm also an artist and a member of the Graham community. And as a member of this community, I know that if Graham is ever going to have true community, a community of peace, mutual respect for all members, that the statue of the unknown Confederate soldier needs to be removed. Now, some people may not consider this statue to be a piece of art, but for now, I will address it as being art and will refer to it as a statue and a monument. With that said, it is important to know what art is in the context of community. What we see affects how we relate to the world. The story images tell us assist us in how we, how we move around the world as human beings, and it creates our cultural identity. Art is an account of our society's cultural history, depicting to the world what we today as a community 
think is important and what we consider to be beautiful and what we value. The statue that is in front of the courthouse is of an unnamed Confederate soldier. It was erected and paid for by donations from fundraisers hosted by the female branch of the Ku Klux Klan, who called themselves the United Daughters of the Confeder Confederacy in 1914. Yes, this is America's history, and as America's history, it should not be erased or forgotten. Because this part of America's history was so nefarious and inhumane, we need to remember it so it will never happen again. <clears throat> However, it is because of this part of America's history that I can stand here today and say that this statue an oppressive, is a representation of an oppressive history that does not represent what I know the community of Graham to be. The community of Graham stands for friendly people, a really cool movie theater where you can have a family date night and you can go to the movies and then go to the diner it stands for a friendly hardware store connected to a great place where you can get a wonderful haircut for your canine companion. It stands for beer companies, thrift shops, and coffee shops. Graham is about friends and family. It is a friendly place that is what we should be depicting in this town. Not oppressive histories, hatred, war against brothers, and division. It is also not about people showing off their guns, making threats, that if someone speaks up for their rights, they may be in danger of being shot and killed. This community does not have to be like other communities around the country that are dealing with removing Confederate statues in a violent way. This community can be a good example of what to do and to truly be an inclusive and loving community. We can be leaders rather than followers. And as, an Ameri as Americans, we need to be conscious of how we depict this time in our history. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Reed. The next person who signed up to speak is Amy Cooper. My name is Amy Cooper. Um, I'm a resident of Burlington. I have been my whole 31 years of life. Alamance County Commissioners. I am here today as a concerned member of the community. This past Saturday, I was a volunteer in downtown Graham for the Alamance County People's Referendum. I was there to encourage community members to engage in democracy by voting on two issues, the Confederate Monument and 287G. The vote was for everyone, and we encouraged all people, no matter where they stood on both issues, to come by and use their, vo their vote as their voice. The goal for the event was to bring the community together to vote on issues that impact all of us. The opposing of individuals did not create a welcoming environment for these community members at all. In fact, they actively harassed the people participating. They hurled racial slurs and threatened acts of violence on the event participants. The statue is frequently drawing members of the League of the South to Graham. The League of the South is a white supremacist hate group. They travel North Carolina spreading their hateful retort. How can Graham be welcoming to the black and brown community when a statue that glorifies and rallies white supremacists is in the heart of the city? These individuals have targeted my family and black and brown families in the community online by posting pictures of our children and sharing personal information in an attempt to dox us. Most concerning of all, I have a video of the sheriff of Alamance County engaging with the white supremacists and actively bullying a referendum participant. Our sheriff, whose job is to serve and protect, verbally degraded a woman and laughed when others called her names. I was appalled and quite frankly embarrassed to witness the sheriff of our county engage in this behavior openly. As a community member, I'm asking you to open your eyes to what this statue attracts. And if you still don't see it, I'll tell you, it attracts ugliness. It attracts people that continue to disrupt the atmosphere of inclusivity in downtown Graham, which is what the statue was originally intended for. I do not agree with that, and that is why I'm here. I want to be a part of this community. The colorful murals in Graham State love Graham. Love always wins. You belong here. That is what I want to feel when I'm in Graham. How can Graham express so much love and yet allow so much hate? It is your job to do the right thing, to create a nurturing environment that welcomes everyone. Please pay attention to what is happening in our town. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Uh, 
I believe that we've had three speakers now who have advocated for removing the monument. And so I would ask uh, speakers to, when they're considering their remarks, to remember that our public comment policy is uh, no more than three speakers on any one topic per meeting. So now we've had three speakers who are advocating for removing the monument. So the next person, so if that is your intention to speak on that topic, if you would just say pass or, you know, something like that, that would be useful and helpful. Um, but if you're here to talk about something else, then we're delighted to listen to that. So the next person signed up is Cliff Carter. Okay. <sighs> Hello. Uh, Welcome, sir. I'm How Carter. you doing? Good. Um, I'm Cliff Carter. I, um, I live in Burlington, North Carolina. And because of uh, policy, I think, think you've probably hamstring, <laughs> hamstrung what I was about to say. Um, so I will be rather artistic in, 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 in my approach in saying that what I'd like for this room to do is, from an artistic standpoint, take a look at what was just discussed and I would like for you to to create a picture in your mind a picture of a bird in a cage and when you stand extremely close to that cage that you can't see the bars in the cage your bars are in the periphery of your vision to a point where it's unseen by your eye but when you step back away from those bars and you get back just a little bit further, the bars become, become very, very clear. And what I see is the cage in this room right now. The cage in this room, the periphery of your vision is cleared when you step back and you look at the bars. And what I see is sad. It's timidity. It's fear, it's complacency, it's stubbornness, and peer pressure. We have to get beyond that because the discussions that have happened before me have asked a request of this board. We've asked you to take a look at what you have to do in order to satisfy the, the citizens of your community. You have to take action. You have to look at it clearly. You have to step back and you have to to not see this as Mayberry. This is not Mayberry. Mayberry was a town where the only black person in that town was a musician and a football coach. And he had a speaking voice. But there were other people in the town. They were of all different races, all different creeds, and sexual orientations. And this board has the power to strike where it needs to be struck for the community. You need to take action and do what is right. I know it is in relationship to what everybody else has said, and I know you've hamstrung me by not allowing me to say what I need to say, but you have to take action. There's five of you. I heard everything tonight that went before me that said 5-0, 5-0. We have made a decision to make something move. You have the power. You have the power to make something move. And I thank you for your time. And I'm sorry that I was hamstrung and not being able to say what I needed to say. But I think you hear me. That was very thank creative. You. I'll give you that. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <laughs> the next person is Lee Welburn. <laughs> Mr. Welburn? Um, Mr. Welburn appears not to be here. So the next person is uh, Mr. Bill Lashley, Jr. It's not a junior. Nope. I'm sorry. It's written on the piece of paper that way. So. <laughs> Bill Lashley, Burlington. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I'm a firm believer you got to give credit where credit's due. And uh, the board has had to make some difficult decisions during these difficult times with dealing with very difficult situations. I believe your decision that you made a, a, with the budget was prudent and showed good stewardship for the taxpayer dollars. Recently, Mr. Haygood, 
showed us the sales tax receipt report, which showed uh, improving conditions compared to what we had projected. And I think that's positive. That's positive for the taxpayers and it's positive for the citizens of Adamantz County. And I certainly hope that that trend continues. Another positive aspect and another reason why I'm here tonight is I hear a lot of negative stuff, but I don't hear a lot of positive things about the county. You know, the health department, the health department has done a great job in this, this, this serious time. They have proven to be a valuable asset. They, uh, in, they give uh, information and instructions on how to keep Alamance County citizens healthy and safe, and they've done a su superb job. But uh, last but not least, I want to thank the sheriff and his staff. They have an incredibly hard job, and they do a great job every day. Now, I fully support law enforcement and first responders. You know, Mr. Uh, Sheriff Johnson believes enforcing the laws. Enforcing the laws on the books makes every one of us safer. As we see on our images on our television screen, we see places around the country who do not hold that as a high priority, enforcing the laws. And we see the destruction right in front of our face. And I am a firm believer that a majority of Alamance County citizens do not want the police officers and law enforcement to be defunded or disbanded. Can you imagine what it would be like to be your own individual police department in which you make the decisions based solely on everybody else? You solely make the decision on how things are going to be taken care of. Sheriff Johnson does a great job enforcing the laws and I applaud him for that. Can you imagine what it would be like if we didn't have the police department? Can you imagine the, the death and destruction that would occur? And the sad thing is, commissioners, we don't have to imagine. We can see it with our own eyes. We can see on our television screens what is happening to our country. And thank God we have a law enforcement officer here who does not want Alamance County citizens to live like that. And I applaud him for that. And I think that if we will just work together, we can, we can actually solve any issue that's in front of us. But the first thing that we have to have in this community is we have to have a safe community. If our community is not safe, we do not have a community. And I certainly don't want to see that happen to the great county of Alamance County. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Lashley. Um, Sheriff, it sounds like they're using a drum now. Does anybody else hear a drum? <laughs> it's probably your car there, baby. <laughs> <laughs> My car is so would crush it. There's no beating on it. It doesn't, nobody, y'all don't think that sounds like a drum? It sounds like they're beating on something. I can't, I can't tell. Okay. Well, if it's not disturbing y'all, we'll move forward. All right, next person is uh, Jay Kennick. Hello, I am Reverend Jay Kennett and I live in Burlington, North Carolina. And I'm here to talk uh, like the one of the previous, I'm going to make it broader, which I intended anyway, to talk about community. To talk about a preacher who was dynamic in the public square who talked about beloved community. That thought wasn't new to him. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King relied on the vision of his faith in the person of Jesus, who sought that all who were oppressed should be free, who tried to speak of a justice that restored and centered his ministry in the love of neighbor as oneself. Not just neighbors who looked like you or talked like you or from the same hometown or even loved like you or worshiped like you. Beloved community is a lofty ideal, but it is something we can work to learn. In beloved community, there is not systemic racism. There are not statues engraved in law or in stone that lift one race or ethnicity over another. In beloved community, we do not separate families, taking parents from their children and we hold to the biblical command 
that says, Welcome the immigrant as your neighbor. For in beloved community, injustice against one is injustice to all. In May, we missioned, witnessed a horrible antithesis to beloved community. As we saw in our country, a black man's life extinguished for eight minutes and 45 seconds as the world watched on. Horrified, hundreds of people in this community came together to say that we must do better. We must dismantle both those images of racism and the systemic racism it represents. We must welcome the immigrant. We must work together to create a vision of community where all are welcome, where Black Lives Matter, where the work and contribution of our Latinx neighbor is valued. Today, in seeking to do this work, this community comes to you with ballots representing our voice, with the voices in the street, and we call upon you to work to create that unity, that community created in equity and justice. You have some questions before you. One of those has already been mentioned about the statue, but also there's the issue of the 287G program, which in any form should not be a part of our community. I invite you to be a part of that work of creating beloved community, to do the work of justice and inclusion, and to make your voice known that we want a community built on the value and respect for all lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> all right, next is uh, Stephanie Strobel. Commissioners for hearing my voice I'm also gonna have to be a little bit creative um, <laughs> so I want to give you guys some information just some quotes um, Confederate Vice President Alexander H Stevens made a speech in Savannah Georgia in 1861 comparing the cornerstone of the Confederate Constitution to the US Constitution this is what he said quote the new Constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our particular institution, African slavery as it exists amongst us, the proper status of the Negro in our form of civilization. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution." Unquote. He went on to say, and I quote again, its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests, upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. That slavery's subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. Let me repeat that. Stevens declared that the very cornerstone of the, con of the Confederacy was that the Negro is not equal to the white man. There are no less than 22 mentions in support of and protection of slavery in the Confederate Constitution. As quoted from that document that's currently held in the Yale Law School Library, here are two examples. Article 1, Section 9, Paragraph 4. No bill of attainder, ex post facto law, or law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves shall be passed. Article 4, Section 2, Paragraph 3. In all such territory, the institution of Negro slavery as it now exists in the Confederate States shall be recognized and protected by the Congress and the territorial government. And I have that printed out here. Let me and give it to the county manager and he will pass it around. My notes. You probably just want the document. 
Oh, actually, you know what? I am going to give you my notes because it also has the references on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Strobel. All right. The um, next speaker is Carrie Griffin. May I approach your desk with the ballots? Or no, you may not. You may give them to the county manager like everybody else has done. Thank you. Good evening. On, I'm Carrie Griffin and I live in Burlington, North Carolina. On August 3rd, in the spirit of transparency and respect for the democratic process, we called upon the Alamance County Commission to hold a public vote on two important issues affecting community members. One, the relocation of the Confederate monument from the courthouse, and two, the repeal of the 287G Warrant Service Officer Program in the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. We then ask that you communicate your response to this request by the end of business day on August 10th. Commissioners, not only have you failed to respond, but to this day, you have failed to acknowledge the legitimate concerns of our community in regards to these issues. You have proven yet again your unwillingness to listen to all of your constituents, and you've re your refusal to provide any real oversight to a sheriff who went behind your back and against the expertise of the county attorney to sign an agreement with ICE without a proper vote. You made it clear that if we want democracy and accountability, we will have to make it ourselves. That is why on August 15th, a multiracial and multi-generational coalition of people, including community leaders from Siembra, Down Home, Forward Motion, Carolina Jews for Justice, and others, planned and organized the Alamance People's Referendum. Our goal was simple. We wanted to give residents in Alamance County an opportunity to be heard, and we did. People participated from every municipality in this county, from Elon to Mebbin, from Burlington to Snow Camp, and everywhere in between. We tried our best to make voting in this referendum as accessible as possible to everyone, regardless of their opinion on the issue. We promoted it on the news, the paper, online, and invited everyone to chime in. There were eight ballot locations around Alamance County, as well as a mobile location visiting neighborhoods. We even offered an online voting option for those who were unable to visit a polling station. In total, 1,798 people voted, or 1,798 people voted, of which 1,339 people voted that the county commissioners should move the monument, while 462 people voted against its relocation. 1,289 people voted that the commissioners should repeal the sheriff's 287G program with ICE, while 450 people voted against its repeal. While this vote may have been symbolic, it must be made clear that just in a matter of days, hundreds of residents in the county came together to participate in this referendum. This speaks to two things. These two issues are very important to our community and must be treated that way. And two, people want to have a say in the decisions that shape the present and future of Alamance County. Moreover, the results of the referendum make another thing clear. The people of Alamance are ready to move into the future, a future where anyone and everyone feels safe, welcome, and have the same opportunities to thrive. And that if those elected to office fail to do their job, then we will make sure to find others who will. We are not going to wait for you any longer. We will organize ourselves to protect each other hey, and build true. a movement to move Alamance forward into the future. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. The. Um, Public comment is uh, 909 and the 30 minute public comment period is over. So now we'll move into commissioner's responses. Um, so whoever wants to get started, just if anybody has I, a response. I, I'm going to have to respond to what you had to say. Yeah. Three of us up here are going to be gone come November. So you have a, you can have a ballot. It's called an election. Can I respond to that? No. No. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Unless, uh, if, if a commissioner has a direct question for oh, okay. someone, then they can, um, of course, answer a question if, a, you know, yeah. somebody has asked it. But if it's a general comment, we don't going to get into an argument or an no, exchange back and forth. That's not an argument. That's the election coming up. So, you're gonna so I'm sorry, but um, I think I answered your uh, request to respond. Um, I'd like to talk. I'd like to 
say something. I am not a racist. I don't like to be called a racist. And most of the people in, the, in this town, in this county, are not racist. But don't step on our feet. Don't step on our feet. Please don't. It's not a time for discussion. Mr. Lashley has the opportunity to say what he thinks is right. I'd like to make a comment. Okay. I've thought about this issue a lot. I think I actually engaged one of you Saturday. I heard some comments made earlier about tactics on Saturday morning. I was informed about the event that straightway, I believe it was straightway Baptist Church organized to support uh, law enforcement and uh, was invited to join them. I did. Several other commissioners appeared there that morning. I observed a whole lot of activity. I didn't see, I could, be, I could be wrong, but I didn't see much, if any, activity from the group opposing the stand against the monument. Now, what I did see was a gentleman presenting the gospel message and being retorted and I can't even repeat the language being used against him as he did nothing more than repeat the message of salvation. Now folks, we've come, this country's 200 and some odd years old, 250, 260, I hadn't done the math recently. I was raised in the South. I was raised to treat everybody. My dad would have absolutely killed me if he ever thought I did anything to treat one individual differently from another and to show respect. At the same time, I was raised to respect my elders and to respect my history. Now that doesn't mean that the history was right there are a lot of things about the history in this country that none of us would want to see repeated. There are a lot of things about the history of this country that were cultural. Slavery is thousands of years old. It is still carried out in the world today. Much to our disdain in this country, we try to fight against it. Nobody in this room that I know, and I know these gentlemen and, and lady, I've known them for years, there's nobody on this dais that would want to see it repeated. We represent all of the citizens of Alamance County. Now you can shake your head, but we do. If anybody wants to talk to me and you ask people, if, you, if it's not the truth, if you ask around, you'll find out it is. If anybody wants to talk to me about an issue, I will talk to them. I may not agree with them, but I've got friends on both sides of this issue, good friends. We represent, if you, if you understand what I'm saying, we represent everybody in the community. There are people in this community who want to see that statue remain exactly where it is. We represent them just like we represent you. Now you, know, may, not, you may not appreciate that fact, but we do. We have a law in North Carolina that says that monument can't be relocated. We don't have the authority to relocate it. You can... We don't. Please, um, yeah, you do. please don't uh, interrupt Mr. Carter. He didn't interrupt any of you all when you were talking, or and when you were talking, he listened respectfully. And this is the time for the audience to listen to Mr. Carter respectfully. I would not interrupt you. 
I would treat you with respect. But I have seen so much disrespect. That I can't even, I've seen the sheriff get disrespected. I've seen our law enforcement get disrespected. And I've seen your organizations get disrespected, none of which is right. If we can't come together and try to find solutions, we're not going to get any problem fixed. Our job up here is to find solutions. But now, you have to, any way you cut it, we represent all of Alamance County. 100% of Alamance County does not want to see that monument moved. You don't have a right to make a comment while I'm speaking, please. I can leave. It's fine. I was wondering why you haven't responded to people that... Please leave. ...that want you to... You haven't responded to that. You're all white. You don't represent the community. Ma'am, ma'am, please leave. Ma'am, please leave. Please leave. Thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Not yours. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lashley, Excuse you're me. not helping. <laughs> Can I actually make a public point of order and eliminate the flash photography? I'm going to have a medical issue, and I really would not believe I'm trying to be respectful. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes. Flash photography can be disruptive to some people, and we'll ask the members of the media to respect that in our audience and not cause them discomfort or medical problems. Thank you, and I apologize on behalf of the commission for that. May I finish, please? Please do. If you want to talk, I'll talk. And I'll respect and listen to what you have to say. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Stafford? Well, I didn't want to, but I'm going to. <laughs> You know, I'm 70 years old, and I've been around the political block a few times in my life without a lot of effort. And I seem to get to where I want to go. But I'm going to say something about this non-binding promotion that you did here with the ballots. I was shocked to hear that it was only two to one. Two to one victory for a clear promotion of philosophy, agenda. I don't consider it a slam dunk in the least that 500 people showed up. Is that not two to one? Am I right there? I think it is. Yeah, that 500 people showed up in the adversity of the. Of the Avenue and voted against a clear agenda. In my opinion, I would gamble all day long. That's evidence. You ain't even close. This is not me. Well, whoever. Oh. She's gone. She's gone. Yes, yeah, she left. Well, I that's don't know who true. promoted it, but uh, that's for the record. Okay, that's all I got to say. Okay, anything else? All right, um, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, I had a lot of thoughts about some of the things that were brought up, but uh, I'm not sure, you know, how much to get into things. Um, Ms. Reed, you mentioned that art is what we consider beautiful and having value and just sort of as a <coughs> esoteric thing, I would challenge that conception of art. I think art can also be hideous and ugly and just um, disturbing. You know, Robert Maplethorpe was an uh, artist that was active some years ago and it can be provocative. Not all art is intended to make people reflect on beauty and, and uh, things that are valuable. Um, Ms. Cooper, you mentioned that uh, people were harassed and threatened, and I'm sorry to hear that. I've heard that from 
uh, others who, people on both sides of the issue, oh, Ms. Cooper left, people on both sides of the issue has pointed fingers at the other and said that they're not behaving, that they're being disrespectful, that they are causing conflict, that they are um, using obscene uh, gestures, using unkind language, and things like that. So um, <coughs> when you hear it from both sides, it makes it hard to uh, sort it out. Mr. Carter, I appreciated your reference to the cage, the bird in the cage. I thought that was an interesting and fresh take on the situation at hand, and I appreciate what you said about that. Um, Ms. Strobel, you shared a, uh, your quotes about the Confederacy, and um, those are painful things to hear spoken out loud. And I think it is good to reflect, take time to reflect on the foundations of the Confederacy. I think that that is uh, something that we need to remember and reflect on. Um, and then with this referendum thing, I know somebody personally who voted 10 times. Yeah. And you could just fill out an online form and submit it. And um, I thought it was, uh, the reason I didn't respond to the email about it is because the form has your vote and it also has in the same thing your name and address and your phone number and your email address and I didn't have a way of knowing myself whether or not the vote is disaggregated from that personal information but it looked like clearly to me that the design of the referendum was to generate a database of contacts of people who agree with you or agree with not you people sitting here but agree with that point of view for purposes of fundraising voter registration and get out the vote efforts later um, so that makes it very difficult for me as an elected official to take results of that seriously when it appears to me to be um, I guess phishing is not really the right word in the internet wor world because phishing is when you're trying to steal somebody's personal information for a for a um, you know a fraudulent purpose but it's like fishing but for a political purpose and so um, that disturbed me when I saw that and that is why I personally don't really give this rep it's not it's not a referendum it's a petition people sign their name to a petition it's we a repackaged at the beginning of the meeting. yeah <laughs> repackaged petition so um, that's all I'll say about that one, one last thing I will say is that I've seen comments online there are two things that I've seen said online that have um actually there's three things I want to say one is that we have been challenged tonight as being unapproachable and unaccepting of different people's perspectives however we invited you to come from the other room we invited we said we've got room in here let's let the people come in from the overflow room not because there's space let's sit here together you know your presence in this room is a, is a, is a evidence itself that we are welcoming of you you know we don't have we don't check people's IDs when they're coming in and say okay you look like you're a Democrat so you go in the overflow room it doesn't work like that everybody it's very very important to me as an elected official and as chair of this county commission that everybody is treated by the government in the same way all the time no matter what their point of view is that is very important to me um, so I wanted to say that number two in the same kind of vein I've seen comments online that we are vetting people's public comments and that is a lie okay we do not vet people's public comments um, when people sign up to speak <coughs> Sometimes, in, in the times of COVID, where we have to have uh, people, we give people the opportunity to call in, we give people the opportunity to email, we're trying to make sure that there's room for people in the overflow room, our clerk, of, uh, clerk to the board will call people and work with them and try to make sure that people understand what the rules are, how to follow the rules, and she works very hard to make sure that everybody is treated fairly and everybody is treated the same. And if some people have taken that and... Um, found that to be some kind of vetting process that is absolutely not true and if anybody ever gets asked 
Um, well, I, I will say that it's possible you might be asked about your content of your comment just to put it on here so we can keep track of how many people. Because like if we have, suppose it was about 287G and people were upset about it or people were for it and you were calling in, you wanted to get put on the list, she may ask you, what is the nature of your comment? It's about 287G. Well, what's generally, you know, going on there, you, you know, so that she can tell you we already have five other people signed up and so if they all show up, you're probably not going to get to speak that night. And so that helps people to know what's going on. And so that is the only purpose for ever asking people what is the nature of your comment is so that we can assist the public in knowing what's going on so people can make their own decisions about what they want to do with their time on a Monday morning or a Monday night. And then the last thing that I want to say is that I've seen comments online about um, me and my mess up here with all my papers and it looks like <laughs> I'm fooling around with my papers too much and then I'm writing. People will take issue with the fact that I'm writing and I'm not always looking at the speaker. I am a, um, I'm a person who learns by writing. When, and I've always been this way. I was the way as a student. You know, teachers talk and I'm writing down everything that they say so that later I can go back and look at it. And that is why I can look back through my notes and remember that Mr. Carter is the one who mentioned the bird in the cage. That Ms. Reed is the one who mentioned the art can be what we consider beautiful and of value. And so that is why I'm writing. I'm not writing because I'm not paying attention. I'm not making my grocery list up here. I'm writing because I am paying attention because what the public says to me is very important to me and I want to remember it and to be able to reflect on it. So that's all I want to say about that. Do any other commissioners? In regards to 5 -0 votes, don't forget, there was a 4 one. <laughs> there was. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that is right. All right, Mr. Is there anybody who has anything else to say based on what I said? Um, Mr. County Manager, do you have a report tonight? Uh, just one item, Commissioners, I wanted to be sure and uh, speak to, considering we're uh, getting close to election time, uh, staff of the uh, Manager's Office, Human Resources, IT, and County Maintenance have been working very closely with Kathy Holland and her folks over at the Board of Election uh, to get to help her and her folks get ready for the election that's coming. Um, our staff uh, in HR and IT in particular have worked with Kathy. Uh, they've identified the numbers of people that they need uh, to work this coming election and where those folks need to be assigned. Uh, Bruce has worked very closely with Kathy to help her identify the IT needs that she has. Uh, and there's a lot uh, coming up uh, for between all the different voting locations, which those have also been identified too. And we're, we're working with Kathy and her staff to establish what the cleaning routines of those uh, voting locations will be, what the social distancing plans will be for those sites, as well as uh, working on making sure there's enough uh, personal protective equipment available for poll workers and folks that come in to vote. Uh, so I think on many fronts, uh, county staff have been working very well with the Board of Elections to get ready for the uh, uh, upcoming election. There are, uh, I think the biggest issue from my understanding that the board is facing, board of elections, is it's uh, not exactly clear at this time how many uh, poll workers, election workers are gonna return. As you know, many of our election workers are folks that are re uh, retired or senior citizens. There's a lot of concern about coming back and working. Uh, Kathy and her folks at the board of elections are reaching out to employees that worked uh, the last election to see how many of them are planning to return. Once we hear that, uh, she'll work with Sherry Hook uh, to help figure out how many workers we might need, how to recruit those folks, uh, and get them to, to agree to come out and work the election. So I just feel like it's important that you know county staff and the Board of Election staff are working together closely, getting prepared for the election. Uh, Kathy and her staff at the Board of Elections are doing an excellent job, and our folks are working very closely with them to get the, the plan for the election laid. So. Uh, we know it's going to be a big election. We're expecting large turnouts, and it's very different than any election we've had probably uh, possibly in the history of the country. So uh, uh, we, we've been working with Kathy uh, for weeks now. So um, uh, I just appreciate the work Bruce, Sherry, and our county maintenance folks have done working with Kathy to try to get, get everything ready. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to a good election here in Alamance County. So 
that's all that I have. Great, thank you. All right, so now we have a closed session. I'm going to combine these two motions into one. I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding the claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. as well as to consult with the county attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege in the personnel matter. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. So we're in closed session. All right, I'd entertain a motion to return to open session. So moved. Second. I have a motion and second to return to open session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, um, for in regarding uh, the closed session pursuant to General Statute 143-318.11A3 to consult with the county attorney and preserve the attorney-client privilege regarding a personnel matter. The board gave instructions to the county attorney concerning the handling of the matter. And then regarding the same statute in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege regarding the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al., the board received a report from the county attorney concerning the case. <coughs> so, all the business before the board being concluded. Well, may I ask one question? When is Governor Cooper's uh, ending of, you know, the latest extension of two? It was a three, three weeks. It's supposed to be three weeks, but who knows? September 11th. Yeah. When? 11th of September, I believe. So, we will have one meeting under <laughs> two, hmm. level two. Mm -hmm. All right, we're adjourned. <laughs>